Today, I want to tell you something about the energy management options that exist in CAN. I like to give a summarization about these different options of energy management, which we have in several specifications here in CAN and automation. And at the very beginning, I like to welcome you as a speaker here. My name is Rainer Sitzmann from Canon Automation, GmbH. I'm the general manager and I hold a degree in electrical engineering from the local university. I manage the office from Canon Automation and Canon Automation is 100% daughter of um, the Canon Automation Association. So my task is to assist the Canon Automation um, association in providing all the services they want to offer to their members and the CAN users. And we as CAN Automation GmbH are offering these services. And in addition to that, we can offer some additional services like seminars, conferences, and so on. Furthermore, I represent CAN Automation in the international standardization. So we have their standardization projects where CAN technology is standardized and we try there to give can based devices in these um, applications a certain degree of plug and play functionality so that users can with a minimum of configuration effort put their applications into service and into operation yeah i'm accompanying their standardization project for uh, light electric vehicles that the public charging infrastructure where I accompany the standardization of CAN, can open in the application field of rail vehicles, of um, the CAN communication within a rail vehicle, so on a consist level. And furthermore, also the applications installed on garbage trucks, garbage connecting vehicles, um, they have to be interconnected, they have to exchange some information, and this in a standardized way. And there we have also a standardization project, which I'm accompanying and where I try to increase the degree of importance of CAN-based technology and CAN-based network. Yeah, we are located in Nuremberg. And if you are, have not uh, been with us or if you're not that aware of CAN Automation, CAN Automation Association is the international user manufacturers group that develops and supports can open and other can based high layer protocols. So, this non profit group was founded in 1992 to provide can based technical product and marketing information. So, we are the guys that uh, foster the image of the can technology and provide a path to future networking technologies. So, as I said, we are located in Nuremberg. So, you can give us a call. You can write us an email, you can follow us on our social media channels, and we try to assist you in any cane related context and any cane related question. So you see here a brief review of our history. As I've said, we try to raise the awareness of CAN and we try to assist people in their CAN based projects. And you may know that uh, the development of CAN and all these issues were taking place in Germany and middle of Europe. Uh, nevertheless, we want to propagate the CAN technology and the knowledge of the CAN technology around the entire globe. So therefore, we um, go to other countries, to other areas and inform people on latest developments in CAN and CAN-based networking. So in addition then to providing a newsletter to giving seminars to um, participating in conferences. We offer also a neutral ground for additional development for further um, maintenance of specifications. And there, so you see at the end of this slide that the history of CAN has not been written yet, but we are still writing on it. So in 2012, there had been the presentation of the improved CAN data link layer, the CAN FD on the 13th International CAN Conference organized by SIA. So you see now in the controller chips, 
there's now a new camcorder called available. You can use it now also outside the automotive industry. It is available. The CAN with flexible data rate or in brief CANFD that provides you a higher data throughput, a length of data field, and a higher communication speed. Then there's ongoing business in updating the higher layer protocol. So, for example, we here at Canon Automation, we are maintaining the CanOpen protocol and we update it CanOpen in a way so that you can make use of CanOpen from CanOpen of the advantages of. The KNFD data link layer of this length of data field and the higher data. And furthermore, we have um, accompanied and witnessed the start of the KNXL project in 2018, the end of the year. And this is now running the development of the third generation of KM is close to the end. The specification is almost finalized. And also the developments are coming to its end. And I think at the beginning of the year, we can see first KNXL implementations. So the next generation of KN that allows a much higher data throughput, transporting about 2K of data through a KN-based network. Yeah. Um, you see, KN is still a WIBIT candidate, a WIBIT communication technology. We had at the beginning of the year 703 member companies. So um, there are still uh, people interested in CAN in doing further developments. And a lot of people say CAN is the attractive candidate for our control applications for our embedded network. Um, together with our members, we have some marketing groups, we have some technical groups. The marketing groups are deciding where to standardize something on which event shall we go, where should we present, why it is reasonable in this or that application to use CAN. And if you are not covered by the application fields that you see here written in red, by CAN Open FD, CAN Open Lift, or Municipal Vehicles, and you say, well, I want to stimulate there something, I want to initiate something, maybe in a country, maybe in a certain application field, come to CAN Automation Office, um, indicate that there could be an interest from your side and maybe from other um, even competitors in the market that you like to promote can base solutions somewhere then we are trying to assist you furthermore you see here a summarization of the technical working groups um, in contrast to the marketing groups that is a little bit challenging in times of corona um, the technical groups can work on a virtual base rather well so you see here uh, we have a technical committee it's a steering committee managing our interest groups we have there the lower layer groups dealing with the development of KNXL, of knfd knfd light also it's a lightweight implementation of knfd and some other lower layer issues we have the can open group that has almost done its work it's doing just maintenance of the existing can open specification and profiles we have then a kind of um, related group to this, the Can Open FD group that is updating Can Open in the, uh, with the objective to use Can Open on KNFD data link layer and to make use of all the advantages of KNFD. And the result is then the Can Open FD. We have a group that is accompanying the mapping of J9039 to KNFD. So at, at SIE, this project is running, and our members accompany this process also and give some useful hints to the J9039 group. And furthermore, you can see we have now at least three listed CAN based higher uh, layer protocols on this slide here. And um, it makes no sense to organize the data arrangement according to the communication interface. And therefore, we say let's have one data arrangement maintained by the IG profiles and then let's map the bus independent description to the communication technique either can open can open if DOJ939 therefore we have now this IG profiles furthermore we have some rather new group so the high availability group and under patronage of the high availability group we have the task force redundancy that is dealing with the um, 
availability in mission critical applications of the communication link. So they are discussing um, several redundancy concepts, among others, the bus line redundancy. And they are discussing how can you use or implement and support and use bus line redundancy in cane based embed control applications. And finally, you see a working group safety and security. Security issues get more and more of interest and uh, security issues have to be solved. And therefore, this group tries to provide some answers. It's currently introducing a can open security layer and some other recommendations and specifications in this context. So one warm welcome. If you like to join these activities, then please contact Can Automation. I just stepped out of a working group that is called Task Force Bootloader, directly maintained from the technical committee, and uh, discusses a lot of questions and side effects in the context of updating can based devices via the CAN interface. And uh, this is also a subject that has to be considered in our today's topic, energy management options, as many of these devices um, have the demand to be updatable via the um, CAN interface. And therefore, this can be an interesting working group for you as well. Um, briefly, to the CAN, uh, to the services offered by SIA, maintenance of the SIA specification, and of course, some doing some marketing and some explanation. So we try to assist system designers, device manufacturers in a technical or marketing oriented way, as I've explained now already. And from time to time, we organize conferences, meeting points for experts, for CAN users, discussing the latest CAN issues. The conference presentations and proceedings from the last one that uh, took place from 14th to 17th June uh, this year is totally available. So if you say why the Christmas season, for example, that you say, hey, let's have a look on that, then um, you can have access via your office and you can get a lot of valuable information. Also, the valuable information you find here in our publications, you see here the summarization. And at the end, I will also highlight the newsletter and especially our email services. Well, welcome um, to our group here. So in the meantime, we have also some additional attendees here live on the show. So I think now it's worthwhile to start with our subject. Yeah, energy management options. Um, I like here to say, well, we have a lot of valuable documents at Canon Automation Office dealing with energy management, energy measurement, and uh, these things supporting various energy management concepts, describing uh, applications where energy management is a vital task. And therefore, I thought it is worthwhile talking a bit about that and providing a summarization. What is available at Canon Automation Office or um, in the CAN application field in general with regard to this subject? So you see here, um, energy the energy transformation is currently a big issue. So um, you know, we have global warming, we have to reduce the carbon dioxide emission, we have to um, think about alternative ways for energy uh, generation. We have left on a globe which is very energy demanding, although we have started to implement lots of energy saving methods due to the increased demand for energy, um, the energy consumption on the globe um, hasn't decreased but increased over the last decades. And we have to think about concepts how to um, get to energy generation that is free of carbon dioxide emissions. So we see here solar power plants, we see windmills and other forms of um, energy generation. And what is not very apparently that we look on a lot of CAN applications. So CAN is used in all of these applications in solar power plants, for example, for the tracking, for the uh, controlling the inverters, for a lot of uh, sensor uh, networks to collect 
the various sensor data to uh, monitor the, the conditions around uh, such a solar power plant or within a wind mile. So can, is there um, a very important part to enable these kind of applications? And you see here on this slide that we have there already profiles for these kind of applications. We have profiles for photovoltaic system, photovoltaic control systems. We have profiles for wind power systems. So in contrast to the photovoltaic, not directly called like that, but um, for condition monitoring, closed loop controllers, the <coughs> profile CR4 or 6 for measurement device and closed loop controllers is very applicable. We have for subsea instruments, a CR443. And we have also documents that are very close to this application. So especially if you have energy that is not always available, but for example, solar energy, of course, only during daytime and not during nighttime. So you want to store energy somewhere for energy storage. We have then the battery charging system, for example, described in CR418, 419. And you like to do energy management in a sophisticated way where you say we have several um, sources of energy. Some are controllable, some are more stochastically available. We have several loads, the same way, controllable, stochastical, anytime available. And you want to manage when to take which energy source and when to apply which kind of energy sink. So um, this is not that new to CAN-based systems. We have there um, a lot of solutions. And during the next uh, couple of minutes, we want to have an insight what is really available. And nowadays, it is very necessary in all the applications to use the energy, the available energy, in an efficient way especially today where energy gets more and more expensive on the one hand for political reasons, on the other hand, also for market reasons. So um, we have to think about the, uh, to use energy in a very efficient way. And the first step to use energy in an efficient way is um, to measure the energy consumption, to have special regard on the energy consumption of your devices. And I think one of the first groups that thought about this and standardized this in their specification had been the group for elevator control, for lift applications. They introduced the energy management as well as different energy saving modes into the CR417 application profile for lift control. So on the one hand, they had the possibility to measure the lift application's energy consumption. So there exists a specific directive, the 4707, uh, which demands an assessment of the energy consumption of the elevator. And now you have not just to assess the energy consumption, but you can really measure the energy consumption and prove this is the energy consumption of my application. And to reduce the energy consumption and to optimize the energy consumption, they said, well, it's rather apparently that you can say during daytime, the elevator has to be available, but during nighttime, no one is in the office, so we can switch it off or switch the entire application or low power mode, so we can save energy. Um, during daytime, it is not that apparent when is the application needed. Could we degrade somehow the functionality, scale down the functionality, with the objective to save energy and at the end of the day, also money, for example. So the lift control application 417 were one of the first that inserted some energy saving modes and allowed during um, system runtime to um, introduce energy management in a way that you say, okay, during my running system, I know exactly what's the current state of operation, mode of operation of my application. And depending on this, I can switch my application in certain levels of energy saving modes. 
Um, in a similar way, not tailored directly for the elevator control, but in a generic way, we have developed device profile. It's a device profile CR458. Um, and this device profile is for energy management and for especially for energy measurement. And it supports three device classes, simple devices that are monitoring the energy, especially the energy consumption. And we have the possibility to implement 458 in a way that you have a little bit of smarter device that you can have an eye on various parameters, for example, for motor controllers, and a complex device that allows you um, dedicated complex energy management task. So we see here on this slide um, the different device classes and which kind of function they offer, the simple class for total energy metering, and you can reset your energy meter. The smart device class has the ability to differentiate between several phases and to measure voltages between phase and ground, phase and neutral, and so on. And you have a complex device class, as I've said, that allows you to have in mind a lot of uh, parameters that are necessary for a complex energy management. We see here on the next slide a layout from the specification where you see the several parameters that are standardized. Also, an advantage that you have now the parameters relevant for energy measurement and the basis for further actions in a harmonized format. They are not always. Um, in a manufacturer specific way available where you have to mess around if you want to compare parameters from different devices but the format is harmonized and you know you compare the right parameters the right interpretation with each other and this starts with the nameplate where you find the manufacturer the accuracy class the gorging parameters office stuff for gorging and um, who was responsible for example and then we find the corresponding uh, parameters for the application, the total energy meters. Um, I have the possibility to reset. I can count this. I have the commands. Um, and I get also the information. How do I get the data? What are the prefixes and the ported resolutions of the measured values? And the nice thing of this CR458 is it is designed in a way that you can add it to any implemented can open device. So I like to remind you on the can open device architecture. And in this device architecture, we have as heart of any can open device our object dictionary, our device internal database. And this device internal database, this object dictionary, has an area. This is called um, the standardized area where you have your application parameters that are standardized by a CR device and application profile. And these parameter, this parameter range is um, structured into several sections. And every section has the size of 800 hex object. And here you can implement the 458 as an additional so-called logical device. So you can have your application parameters like a drive or here an even complex laboratory automation device. And in addition to that, you can add the parameters relevant for energy management and energy measurement. So rather simple to implement. Furthermore, you can um, consider also on power saving. So based on the measurement, we provide in a further document and an additional framework to see if we want the energy saving. So in the document CR301, additional application layer functions, there exists the part nine. And this part nine introduces several energy saving modes. So there's an energy saving mode zero, and there is no energy saving at all active. The device is 
operating to 100%. And you have now the option to implement several energy saving classes, degradating the device functionality, scaling down of the provided functionality, increasing the amount of energy saving up to the last mode, the last energy saving mode where you are in a sleep mode even or even in a shutdown. So the extent up to which you are doing the energy saving in one of these classes is up to you, up to the device designer, but you have the possibility of these cascades to say, okay, um, I can find you now the energy consumption of my device depending on the current use case. So what you're doing here is device um, radiation so that you can say, okay, I have the possibility to scale down the functionality of my device. And this we can do also on the lowest layers, also on the microcontroller level. There exists already hardware that supports this, that you have the shutdown of unused microcontroller cores, independent from other devices in the network or by external commands. So both options do exist, but you can do it also independently, highly distributed. Every device can decide for itself whether it likes to introduce a certain energy saving, yes or no. It can partially um, not power um, microcontroller peripherals, can reduce frequency, high voltage. So you see there are several options. And if it's supported by your hardware, you can take action and save energy in your application when it's applicable. <clears throat> so to avoid that the device is just doing uh, what it likes, but that you have a certain degree of control over your device, the CR302-9 allows uh, a specific adjustment for power sake. So we can uh, specify which power saving modes are applied, um, which do exist. We can demand certain power saving modes depending on when a specific power saving mode is demanded. Then the device by itself can calculate the demand values for power saving and it can inform you what's the current power saving state. And we have both options. We can pre-configure this and the device can decide by itself when to go through which power saving state. It's like uh, it is done by your laptop. When you do for a certain time, no action at the laptop, then the screen scales down. The laptop starts energy saving. When you do for a longer time, nothing. Maybe it goes into a certain standby mode and Similar way we can do now in a harmonized way in can open environment. So here are some examples visible. So if you imagine uh, a service robot on a fairground, um, then you can say, okay, maybe if the service robot is in the entrance door, informing uh, which exhibitors are in the exhibition hall, then maybe. Uh, the motion control is in a standstill or power saving mode at maximum. Maybe from time to time the antenna is needed to get some information where's the current location of the, uh, of the service robot. And the terminal itself is working to full extent because now it's the task to display the information who is available in the exhibition hall. So just an example where several devices and applications mounted on one service robot, maybe in different states of energy saving. Similar examples you will find for uh, Pedelecs and other battery powered mobile applications. This brings us to the fact which kind of energy saving does exist, which energy saving philosophies do exist. And I think we differentiate mainly between two philosophies for energy saving. The one is the pretended networking, the other one, the partial networking. 
The pretended networking, there we have devices that need to level electrical power consumption to a minimum, which is needed to fulfill the actual use functions. So any device can do this, for example, uh, by itself. So there's not necessarily a harmonization that all over the network, there's a central controller and somebody does something depending on the received commands, but you can do this highly distributed. On the other hand, we have the partial networking there. This is more or less controlled by a central instance in the network. And from this point of view, you want to initiate that the devices enter a low power mode till a certain wake up signal occurs. And pretended networking, we talked already about. So this you can realize, for example, with the functionality provided in SIA 302-9. Partial networking, this we know from the automotive industry as well. And also here we have in CAN-based networking good solutions. So here we see some use cases. When do we need partial networking? Just explain the use case, the need for. Um, when you imagine a car, then you know, okay, you have a park assistant and you need it when you're parking your car. And a lot of functionalities, so the signals for driving back, the camera, rear camera and all these things, you don't need when you are on a high-speed ride on the highway. So you only need that during the parking process, and then you can put this uh, to sleep mode. The night vision sensor, you need during nighttime, but not during daytime. So during, nighttime, during daytime, you can put it to sleep mode. The rear camera, only when you're driving backwards, otherwise not, so you can sleep. And the trunk lift, only during standstill, not during the high-speed ride. So you see different use cases of the same application and parts of the application, uh, applications are needed, other parts not, they can have uh, a certain space for energy uh, saving. And as I've said, for cane-based networking, we have here a solution, it's the partial network. So in CAN, even CAN transceiver chips can be in a low power mode. So it's according to the ISO 11898-6, which had been introduced in the year 2013. So since these days, we can have transceiver chips with partial networking capability in the low power mode. And we can also have this in transceiver chips according to ISO 11898-5 from the year 2007. So they can be in low power mode, can switch the backline functionality off. So you save much amount of energy, not only by the device functionality switched off, but even the device up to the transceiver and the transceiver running just in a low power mode. And only if a specific frame comes in a dash six implementation, your backline functionality is waking up in the meantime to save energy. So I mentioned already some physical layer specifications. Here you see the summarization, you know, or may know the basic ISO for uh, KN physical layer is and was, has, is the ISO 11898-2 from the year 2003. And we see here, um, this high-speed physical layer didn't allow us any action with regard to energy saving. Um, in 2007, there came the dash five uh, from this ISO 11898, and this specification provided us with a low power mode and remote wake up. So the difference to the next one, to the dash six, which I introduced on the last slide, is that I can only control the entire network. So the entire network has to turn to sleep or has to awake. I cannot control the devices individually, which is available in the dash six now, since the year 2013, the partial networking capability. Um, when KNFD came up, there was the necessity to update also the physical layer according to the operating limits for communication speeds up to five Mbit. And 
Then there was a question, how to deal with dash five and dash six? And do we have to update them as well? And the idea was then to say, well, all of them describing the high speed physical layer and adding some additional functionality with regard to energy saving, the remote wake up, the partial networking. Why not merging all the functionalities to one document? And this happened in the year 2016. ISO published the 11898-2 in an updated way, putting or merging all these older documents together in an updated way, providing operating limits up to 5 Mbit for the high-speed transceiver, providing definitions for the low power mode and for the partial network. So everything is since 2016, one document. What is the functionality that had been added here or uh, invented? We see here a comparison between the contents from the document ISO 11898-5 and dash six. We see in the document dash five, there um, we had a transceiver that had a low power mode and could have energy saving. During sleep mode, you could switch the backline functionality off on low power mode. And in case there comes a wake up frame, which is obviously any kind of CAN frame, then your CAN transceiver will wake up the backline functionality. And in the meantime, when there had been no CAN communication, you could save energy. Um, this means this is applicable, for example, for the use case, you have a Pedelec. You come uh, with your pedelec, you arrive at home, and you put the pedelec maybe in a garage for storage uh, during nighttime, then no further communication is needed. So the entire pedelec application can go into a sleep mode. And then in the morning, you push a button, you start a can communication, everything wakes up, and during nighttime, therefore, you could save energy and there's still enough energy in the battery buffer so that you can take the next ride. For more sophisticated energy management is uh, the ISO 11898-6 transceiver suitable. You have here the partial networking capability. You do not wake up on any CAN frame, but only if you detect the correct wake up pattern, the correct frame. And if this wake up frame has been detected, then you wake up the backline functionality. Otherwise, you go back into your low power mode. So this transceiver enables partial networking and is therefore a little bit more complex. You need here a protocol handler, a frame compare logic. Also, you need here the possibility to provide a, pro um, a wake up pattern to the transceiver so the transceiver knows, okay, which frames shall be considered as wake up frame. So as I've said, you need a frame compare logic. You can say a certain group of CAN frames or you can identify down to the identifier. This a CAN frame exactly shall wake up my application. And this you can configure for certain groups of devices and therefore, you can do an energy management that you can say, this group of devices shall sleep, this one shall be awake. And depending on the mode of operation of your application, you can do some or initiate at any time state switches where another group awakes and another group falls asleep. But consider this wake up sleep handling is a little bit tricky because um, it's like, um, for you, for you, as you know, in the morning, you are not immediately after waking up ready to work to 100%. You need some time for waking. And it's also for the devices, depending on their sleep philosophy, it may take some time from the wake up signal till the moment where they are uh, available. So roughly four to eight K messages, depending on the communication speed. Um, the thoughts that you should have is um, how applicable is this kind of partial networking also for my application? Because 
Um, it's a little bit tricky to find out which devices and device functionalities are needed for specific use cases. So you see here this example for the park distance control communication uh, with other electronic control units in the car is required. So a lot of systems are required uh, where I could get the velocity, where can I display the entire parking process and the, the push buttons, um, what about the gearbox and all these things. So it's not that easy to say, oh, I need only this or that ECU, for example, here the park distance or the park assistance, but I need also interactions with others and all these are needed for this application. In a more generic way, we see this here, for making this partial networking, we have to think about clustering. So we should not control individual devices, but clusters of devices that are operating in the same part of the application that have a similar wake up, uh, uh, sleep and awake behavior. And of course, they must be equipped all with a partial networking capable CAN transceiver. Only then it works. And if you find them, the cluster is depicted on the slide, then you can handle this um, in the intended way. Of course, the sleep mode awake handling puts a lot of complexity to your application. So you have to answer for your application a lot of questions. For example, in which device state is decent to sleep mode allowed in any or only in a specific one? Who is allowed to initiate that the application or device shall go to sleep mode. So are there priorities? If somebody says, um, I want to go to sleep mode, the other one says, no, we should go to an awake mode. So I have already seen applications that ended up in some intermediate states where half of the application said, go sleep. Other one said, uh, stay awake. And there was no decision uh, to solve this conflict during system runtime was a very, very difficult um, um, in this moment. And furthermore, other questions came up, for example, how to monitor guard sleeping devices and how to differentiate a device that is in sleep mode and sleeping from a device that is just not there any longer. So also there exist several solutions and you have to judge which kind of solution is the best for my use case. And the same for um, the decision, or let's say um, in, um, in parallel to, uh, analogy to the decision who determines that the application goes to sleep mode, we have to negotiate and determine who is allowed to wake the system up. Anybody, a certain master, a certain specific device, and the final question, how does a device wake up at all in an unconfigured state? So it would be pretty safe that you say, okay, we are returning like an initial device switch on and a master host controller application can get familiar with the device, can verify the configuration and can put the device then into service. Um, nevertheless, this takes some time. If you have the situation that the device that uh, maybe the car, the pedelec stays at a longer lasting traffic light, then you say, well, maybe we can save energy for the moment, but um, we have no time for an entire configuration check. We have to be immediately available when the request comes wake up so that you do not wake up in an unconfigured, but in a ready configured working time, uh, working point. So immediately available and the, the, the problem is maybe not on a car, but um, there exist applications where the system configuration might have changed during sleep. So how to identify this, whether the system configuration is still in a way that you have a safe operation. So a lot of tricky questions, but the good news is we have in our can open specifications already a lot of possibilities how you can solve these questions. And one document, maybe you haven't heard of it yet, but it exists already um, a few days. It's a document CR320, and it deals with the sleep mode handling. 
So sleep mode handling means how does this sleep and awake behavior, how is this related to the can open state machine? Where do I leave the state machine? Do I leave the state machine at all? And if I leave the state machine, uh, when do I leave the state machine and how can I get back? And the group dealing with this document was discussing, was learning from several application fields that deal with, dealt with this uh, issue. And they said, okay, we go through an initializing state. We have to initialize our can device. And then we are starting the can open device, the can open device FSA with our network management. And in parallel to this, we are starting now our power management. And in parallel to, let's say, normal device application or call it better application mode, we support the alive state where my device is operating to full extent and we have a prepare sleep state and this prepare sleep state i can go there by command or i can go there if certain device internal triggers apply and nevertheless i have still the possibility to return to the alive state and say well okay forget about sleep um, no chance we have to so much workload, we have to do our work. You have also with the prepare sleep mode the chance to solve conflicts. If parts of the application say go to sleep, other parts say no, we have lots of work, we have to stay in the application mode. And then either the decision is you can return to a live mode or you just say, okay, I wait in the prepare sleep mode and as soon as we are all clear, now we can go to sleep. We go to the switch delay, you pass the point of return, and then you prepare the sleep mode, and then you fall asleep. And when you're asleep, you need a kind of trigger, whatever it is, to awake. And while initializing, you come back to your full can open device operation. And to control a device that is capable of sleep mode handling, we have here already some um, the schematics provided, some diagrams, flowcharts. And you see here, there exists one instance, a power management controller that can ask the devices, um, can we go to sleep mode? Then the devices have maybe the ability to say, well, I have some objections, I have some work to do, we can't go to sleep mode yet, or otherwise they can say, no, I'm fine, I don't have an objection. And for the, the, the group thought it is rather advantageous to treat all the devices in the same way. So to avoid any additional complexity, they said here, oh, it could be advantageous if all the devices are synchronized somehow that are now in sleep mode, now preparing the sleep, then going on to sleep, and so on. But in theory, you have also the toolbox available to do it very individually. So to fall asleep, we see here, um, we have the switch delay to prepare everything that is needed. It's not just a simple waiting time, but you can prepare everything that is needed to go to the sleep. And to go to sleep, this can be either initiated via sleep command or dynamically if you have some local timers and say, okay, now they expired and then we go to the sleep mode. Yeah, this is a short insight to the CR320. If you are interested in this, go there and you find the entire complexity and the entire toolbox. It had been developed for energy management in mobile uh, applications like pedelecs, e-bikes, scooters, and so on. And more and more of them, battery buffered applications, they have to deal with a certain amount of energy stored to um, the battery. And then with this limited amount of energy, they have to provide as long as they can the entire functionality. And we see here, this is for all these light electric vehicles, but also more and more service robots that 
work in areas that might be too dangerous for humans, for example, dismantle nuclear power plants or um, uh, bomb removals or um, works that are too difficult for people or works where people are just missing. So we have now the situation that people are missing in the daycare. So there maybe we can um, use service robots that assist you and helps us to stay at home assisted by this kind of robot operating buffer on energy buffer in a battery and therefore they need energy management in a sophisticated way but energy management is not only a task for mobile applications it is also a task for stationary applications so think about isolated farms like we see here in the mountains off grid you have maybe several energy sinks and sources that you have to manage <coughs> solar panels, windmills, diesel generator. And depending on the conditions, you have to think about, okay, I have now to, to generate butter or whatever. And then you say, okay, I have my load. It's maybe controllable, but which kind of energy is available? And I take that one. That is the most reasonable in this moment. And for such kind of applications, there have been some activities at the Fraunhofer Institute um, in Freiburg. And we saw, okay, they were describing an energy management system for these isolated farms applications, where you can manage several power lines, which um, connect devices um, for AC, for DC lines, and uh, which connect sinks and sources. And then we figured out, well, we're doing something similar, not for stationary, but for mobile applications. But in general, the control philosophy is rather the same. And then there was the idea born: why not mapping all this functionality to one profile and using can open for this. And therefore, we have now um, as, or we planned a set of specifications. Some of them are finalized, some just in a work draft level or idea level. And uh, that one that is really finalized is the profile for um, photovoltaic control system. So the profile 437, this includes interfaces to photovoltaic controllers, inverters, wind direction sensors, temperature sensors, radiation sensors the energy sensor, power sensor, and the solar panel tracking system. Furthermore, there can be in the integration network, 439, the wind power system, geothermal heating system, and so on. And you can decide which kind of energy source you like to use in a specific use case and how to treat the um, energy sinks. Yeah, you see, can automation has um, discussed in the past a lot of energy management issues and summarized in its specifications a lot of energy management solutions. You see here a short overview, CR 302-9. Um, I have already presented 320, the sleep mode handling. You have seen in CR 458, the energy measurement. And I touched briefly the CR437, the control system for photovoltaic applications. There exist some additional profiles that allow you a harmonized set of data for energy management. And therefore, I like in the remaining minutes, briefly focus on 418, 419. And the specification 453 and 454. So these are profiles exclusively dealing with energy management. And first one, I want to start with the CR 418, 490. And this, or these are two device profiles, one for the batteries and the other one for the charger. And 
The intent was in the application of forklifts that we can very easily charge the batteries of the forklifts. And we don't care on which charger the forklift uh, goes for charging, but we can very simple establish a connection and charge the batteries. So we have now a device profile that specifies a recommended practice models for a communication link between a battery module and a battery charger. So the required data frames are intended to be sufficient to allow a battery charger, a battery charge to be carried out. So you see here this table of content, and it's kind of a mirror in the document for 80 and for 90. So the data arrangement is completely identical. I know exactly where do I get my data for managing the batteries and to provide and carry out the charge. Additionally, we have some data that is not directly related to charging, but also to the forklift. And this profile is very widespreadly used in forklifts and in the area of AGV. What is missing in 418, 419 is the real energy management. This is left open. We provide the basis for doing energy management, but the entity who does the energy management is left open and also the rules for energy management are left open. A step further is that one here, the document CR453, the power supply. We can open device profile for power supply specifies the communication interface for AC-AC, DC-DC, AC-DC, and DC-AC converters. So it's suitable for programmable and non-programmable power supply devices with single or multiple outputs that are voltage, current, or power control. So you see you have one side where I say, okay, these are my inputs, and you have the control outside. So you can monitor your inputs, and you can provide um, control logic to the outputs and you can start a certain degree of energy measurement if you want to do so. So you see here on the right hand side the corresponding data sets where you see your input monitoring and the control for the output side. A real sophisticated complex energy management this is described by the specification series 454. So CR454 specifies a DC managed power line that is accompanied by a control area network for enabling global energy management in mobile and stationary energy management systems. So um, the, there's a DC managed power line. Well, yes and no. So you can modify this profile as well to control an AC managed power line. Also, this is possible by the 454 specification. And we developed this together with the Energy Bus Association, and we defined device interface specifications. We define all you need for sophisticated energy management based on a can open communication network. It's also conformance testing provided, and you have simplified service and support by means of off-the-shelf tools. So what had been the objectives for CR454? The main goal was to offer an energy management system that provides either central or highly distributed management of prioritized energy sources and sinks in a safe and reliable way. So there shall be a fast setup possible of a safe and secure and stable system. The energy management system covers use cases for mobile applications. So it's suitable for e-bikes, scooters, something what you call charging in the public area, or nowadays we would more say power transfer because um, it opens up both energy flow directions, something what you would call a charging, or also to provide energy to the grid. And you have everything there for fleet management that is needed, for example, for Pedelec fleets and so on. But I want also to highlight that this profile is suitable for stationary applications, such as isolated farms um, as well. So there exists also an application 
in the uh, desert of Egypt, which is used uh, which is using CR four five four for um, the provide to provide drinking water to generate drinking water uh, based on this energy management concept. Um, the CR four five four is open for all kind of energy sinks and sources, where they either controllable or non controllable. Due to the fact that we said all the devices have to have the availability of an update via the CAN interface, it's very easy to keep the system up to date. And we provide it, or we have written it in a way that you have the possibility of an easy maintenance for experts and end users, and you are not really uh, trained in CAN based networking by means of tools. And of course, we have specified huge databases that allow, um, on the one hand, the easy development of energy management and furthermore, an easy connection to cloud computing for condition monitoring tasks, for example, via gateway applications and connection to other functionality. Um, a brief insight um, to the 454. As I've said, you have there the energy management and the global application status. So the energy management system controller provides this. What is the energy management status of my application? But we are on a CAN based system, and this is uh, worthwhile to mention because CAN does not really need a central host controller, a master. It is also possible to set up highly distributed systems, and also we can have masterless applications. So this means any part of the application controls itself, controls also the energy consumption by itself and can decide by itself to which extent the device likes to offer its functionality to the rest of the application, depending on the current use case of the application. And implementations like that are supported by CR454. And we can also provide the information to the system, what are priority things, priority sources, which energy generators should be used first. And if they are dropped out or not available, then we should others. And the same is for priority sinks, which loads, which consumers um, are needed with high priority and which are nice to have in this, they can drop out. So we have standardized the data. You see here also, we have standardized device classes for which kind of application they are needed, for which voltage classes they are attended. So I can have a compatibility check during power up that everything can be operated in a safe way. And devices can provide their functionality. There may be lots of functionalities provided within one single device. It's like these Russian Matryoshkas from the cover. You cannot see directly what's really implemented, really supported, but the CR454 is a very complex specification, providing and considering a lot of functionalities. You see here briefly the databases, so these are the generic parameters that you can measure. What is the current voltage? Um, for example, what's the current uh, current? And we have here something else implemented that you say, well, is it really safe to connect the device to the power line? And to this, we have the ability to measure, uh, let's say, external voltage to compare it to internal. Say, yes, now it's safe. We can combine, or oh, the status on the power line is unsafe. We do not connect our power lines to avoid device damages. So something like that exists in this specification. And there exists also here the control functionality, set the male voltage that uh, sets the current, all these things you can do so together with the generic device control. Yeah, CR454 um, is ready in some parts. So 
part one to six are standardized in the specified in the version two and have been submitted to IC for international standardization. And they have been already voted positive, but uh, have not been published yet, but we hope this will soon happen. We added, I think this year, the device control unit and the HMI unit for the Pedelec control. So often people think um, this uh, 454 is exclusively intended for um, use it energy management in Pedelecs, but you can have it, as I said, also for stationary applications. Therefore, please consider the parts 13 and 14, which are describing just the generic load and the generic generator. And this means together with the energy management system controller, you can add any amount of generators and loads and can implement any energy management system independently whether is it put on wheels or not you can just implement any control um, algorithm yeah we see here as i said the documents where can you find something where uh, what's described and you see here that we describe the specification of all functional elements required in an energy management system and we have there also a finite state automaton for the application specified and this state automaton uh, allows us to monitor the connection of devices and power up of devices so there's included something that is called a compatibility check do the devices that we have here really match to each other so, as I said, this allows us a safe operation. Yeah, I hope um, this was a good overview for you to learn what's um, available in can based networking for um, energy management and energy saving. So, as I've said, it's a current topic, the energy management, um, due to, on the one hand, our objective to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Further, um, energy gets more and more expensive today. So we have double the interest and multiple reasons to save energy and to think about our energy uh, consumption and to reduce the energy consumption. We have learned now in the last about 60 minutes that for CAN-based embedded control systems, we have a lot of energy management concepts supported and they run with and without central host controllers. So we can realize highly distributed energy management applications. So energy saving starts already on the physical layer. I remind you on the CAN transceivers supporting energy saving modes. And finally, you see CAN open adds lots of harmonized functions for sophisticated energy management. So for example, CR454 and other profiles. Yeah, so much for the moment. Um, till you can ask yourself whether you have some final questions on that what I've presented. I'd like to remind you that you can latest, get latest news on our activities and our email services. Those of you that are from a member company can uh, register for the member news on CIA website. It comes once a month. The same way is the info mail is available for all independent of your status, whether you're either from a CIA member company or non-member company. Um, you can visit us as soon as it's possible again on certain fairs. You see here our list where we intend to go to with a booth in 22. So we'd like to welcome you, if it's possible, again, in spite of Corona, on the fairs listed on the slide. We will also have in the next year some so-called technology days where we inform about latest news and trends in CAN-based networking. Um, we hope that we can have deep information on CAN-XL and that we see um, first implementation and can report on first implementation experiences. 
So we have also technology days in Russian and Chinese language, where we discuss in depth certain aspects relevant, can relate it for relevant for the Chinese and Russian market. And you see here our webinar list. We will have also the next year our webinars. And this has been the last year, uh, webinar for 21. We will have next year a broad range of webinars informing about the usage of CAN agriculture vehicle, uh, embedded networking. We will talk about elevator control. We will have next year our 13th anniversary. So we will have an event and give some recaps. So you see um, a lot of valuable information that we want to share with you. And we hope to meet you again also next year. So for the moment, from my side, do you have any questions with regard to that what I've presented? Then I'd like to remind you on our communication channels, once again highlighted on this slide here. And I thank you very much for attending the meeting and hear this webinar and hope it was valuable for you. You learned a lot about the available energy management solutions in CAN. And I like to welcome you once again on one of our next events. And for the moment, I wish you all the best for the rest of the year and for the next year. And yeah, stay healthy and safe in these days. Thank you very much. Bye.